It spreads, yes. Someone sent that to me, and I sent it on for other pastors. We pray for each other. We really do. Um, it struck me the other day, and when we were looking at the hymns for this morning, the church is one foundation. The words that were written this morning, the, the newer version that takes out, you know, her Lord and talks about our Lord, because when we're talking about the church, we're not talking about a her or some vague something out there. We're talking about ourselves. The person who wrote that is Florence Hall Stuckey, who is my professor of worship and preaching at Wesley Seminary. One of the best people I've ever known in my life, and I've missed him since he went to live with Jesus full time a few years ago. But it struck me that I have been, that this week actually is the 40th anniversary of me beginning seminary. I started before I was born. It's amazing. <laughs> and Jackie just graduated from Wesley in 2021, was it, Jackie, you said? You're still telling this stupid joke. This is one of the big jokes of seminary. If you don't get it, it's all right. Peter said to Jesus, who do you say that I am? Peter said, why, you are the eschatological manifestation of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, huh? Because when you're in seminary, you're taught to think about Jesus in different ways. The eschatological manifestation of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God being one of them. Because, you know, you're sitting there and you're thinking, this is not what I learned in Sunday school. I sat in my New Testament office, professor's office when they're beating my head on his desk saying, this is not what they told me when I was growing up. And he said, wake up and smell the theology, baby. Because things are different when you're in seminary. But this is a pivotal moment for Peter and in Matthew's gospel as well. I have to remember that Matthew was writing particularly to the Jewish audience, saying this is the Messiah for whom you have been waiting all these years. This is the one. And so that takes us back to Isaiah, doesn't it? One of the great prophets of Israel. Isaiah, there were really three people who wrote under Isaiah's name. One who wrote before the exile to Babylon, saying you better be careful because God's going to let you reap what you've sown. If you're not careful, you're going to end up in trouble. And they ended up in trouble, didn't they? Being taken in chains out of their land dragged from their homes for generations. Not just a few years, they were gone long enough that their children who had heard about back home and how wonderful it was had no connection at all to the Holy Land, the land of promise. Then Isaiah gets to the point where he's talking in the exile, saying, uh-oh, here we are, what do we do now? What do you do when you're at the bottom is that you look up, right? Anybody here ever hit bottom in anything in your life? Or come close to hitting bottom? Maybe it was grief, maybe it was finances, maybe it was something else, but you just think, I, I can't go any lower. Or maybe you're afraid to say, what's going to happen next, because you know it could be even worse than what's happening now. But when you're at the bottom, you look up, right? And you look forward, and that's what Isaiah of the exile says to them. God has not left you. Then they go back home. you think it would be wonderful, wouldn't it? What did they find when they went back home to the Holy Land? What did they find when they got to Jerusalem? Desolation and destruction. The temple, the city had been destroyed. Everything they had promised their children didn't seem to come true. That's when they had to dig deeper and find some hope, and this is what Isaiah writes to them. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness. You seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you, for he was but one when I called him. But I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden. Imagine going home and seeing everything destroyed. And how many of you have been to Maui in your lives? Anybody here traveled to Hawaii before? Nobody here has been to Hawaii. I haven't either, but I've seen pictures. Oh, I, Alexa's waving her hand. What was it like, Alexa? Beautiful people, beautiful flowers, the greenery, the waterfalls, everything I've heard is just spectacular. And what's it look like now? Wasteland. Because everything has been burned. The recent death toll is over 114 people, and there are still dozens of people missing. Imagine being there in that beautiful spot that is now desolate and being told it's going to be like Eden again. But quite the promise, isn't it, that God is making here? Her desert like the garden of the Lord. Anybody here ever visit the desert? I visited the Painted Desert, which is a beautiful place, but a lot prettier than you think. But still, is a desert turning into a garden is something that God is promising us. 
and joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving and the voice of song. Now here we are at the end of our sort of time in the exile, because what are we coming out of? This pandemic. Everybody's so tired of hearing about the pandemic, aren't you? I am. And have you seen the commercials that say the pandemic's over, but COVID is still here? It's a new variation out there, and people have to be vigilant and have to be careful. But nobody wants to be careful anymore because we're tired of being careful, aren't we? We're tired of wearing masks and not hugging people that we know and love. But that's what spreads this disease. It's a terrible thing. Churches across the spectrum, from Roman Catholic to Protestant to even some of the larger churches have lost members that they're not going to regain because people got out of the habit of going to church. Or a lot of people just gave up hope. So we're coming out of that. How many of you have been grieving? We've had so many deaths in this congregation. People have lost their spouses or their parents or their parents and their spouses in some cases. People have had sickness. People have had all sorts of issues going on in their lives. feels like exile, doesn't it, sometimes? But this is what God is saying to us. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation. For teaching will go after me and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out. My arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look to the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. If it were out like garment, those who live in will all die like gnats. That's not the happiest thought, but that means we're going to die our bodies are going to go to be buried one day, but God's salvation is forever and God's deliverance will never be ended. And we are part of that deliverance and a part of that salvation. Amen. Thanks be to God. So I said, we're coming to this critical moment for Peter. As God has promised the people in Matthew's gospel particularly, he's writing to the people saying, this is the Messiah for whom you have waited. This is the one that's been promised to you. All these years, all these ages, they've promised, God has promised, and God's promise is coming true in Jesus. So Jesus is in the district of Caesarea Philippi, meaning he's not in his hometown. He's away from his people, away from the temple, away from everything familiar. He says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They answer, some say John the Baptist, who has recently died. He was murdered by King Herod. Others, Elijah. Have you ever been to a Seder meal? Elijah's the one with a fancy place setting here. Don't sit at his place when you go into a Seder meal in a Jewish home where they'll say, ah, wrong seat there. He's the one who went up in the chariot, you know, swing low, sweet chariot. That's because Elijah was swept away. And he's supposed to come back before the Messiah. Others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets, Jeremiah being the other great prophet of the exile. And he says to them, but who do you say that I am? What a question for Jesus to look at you and say, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Because that's the question that is important here, but it's important to each of us today. And Peter says what? Not you are the eschatological manifestation of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. He looks at him and says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Yay, Peter. He gets it right again. Because how many times has Peter gotten it wrong? We've seen him. That's why I love Peter so much. He is what you call a hot mess. Isn't he, really? Peter, the one who just sort of blurts out whatever's on his mind, he says, and gets himself in all sorts of trouble. But here he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That is who Jesus is. And Jesus knows that Peter couldn't have come to that conclusion on his own. But he knows Peter. And he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven meaning he has this direct contact with God who opened his mouth and let him proclaim that. I tell you, Peter, on this rock, I will build a church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. That's quite the rock, isn't it? He finally lives up to his name. We talked just last week about how, or the week before about how Peter proved he was the rock when it came to walking on water. He walked on water just like a big old rock, went right to the bottom of the water. But here's the rock that Christ can build a church on. So we're called to be chips off that old block, aren't we? We're called to have the faith of Peter that says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. We're called to be like Isaiah's call to the people there to remember the rock from which we were hewn and the quarry from which we were taken. We're called to know that the, the God who has been our God for all these generations will continue to be our God no matter what we face, no matter how bad things get. God will be our God. 
Christ will be our Savior. But the question remains to each of us today that Jesus is looking at us and saying, who do people say that I am? Who are people telling you that Christ is? What do people who have no faith say Christ is? Not a rhetorical question, you get to answer that one. Who, who are people out there saying that Jesus is who don't believe? Pie in the sky? Heard that one before. What? A good teacher. Maybe, you know, he's a good guy, but... But some people just say he's a ridiculous figment of your imagination. I've heard that one before. Then Jesus looks at each of us and says, who do you say that I am? I want to ask you this morning, who do you say he is? Who do you say that he is? Somebody answer me. Who is Jesus Christ? Your Savior? What else? Son of God. Any others? Now, when I went to seminary, I did learn some things other than the eschatological manifestation of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, which Jesus, by, he really is that. But I learned a new word in seminary, pantocrator. I've said that to you before. Jesus is pantocrator. Because my New Testament professor, Dr. Joseph Weber, the one whose head I beat my whose desk I beat my head against, saying, it's not what I learned in Sunday school, buddy. Um, he said to us, if you really want to be a good seminarian and a good pastor, you need to take Greek. I did not take Greek in seminary because it was a six-credit course, which meant either an extra semester or a summer course that I couldn't afford, so I didn't take Greek. And he said, if you don't learn Greek, learn this one word in Greek, ta panta, all things. All things, all things, ta panta. All things are subject to Christ. All things are subject to Christ. In heaven and earth, below the earth, in all times and all places, all things are subject to Christ, which means pantocrator means that Christ is the ruler of all things. That is a powerful statement there. And if Christ is the ruler of all things, that means that we've got to find our hope again. No matter what happens in our lives, we've got to hold on to hope. Now, Amy Oden was a professor at Wesley after I was there because she was younger than me when she was there. I think Jackie said she may have had her when she was there. She is now at another seminary, but she is a biblical theologian. She says that hope is like a muscle that you need to exercise. What happens if you don't exercise your muscles? What happens? They get weak and floppy. What else? They atrophy. But you can bring it back, can't you, by what? Exercise. Intentional exercise, usually, right? You don't just say, it's going to get better on its own, right? Because what's going to happen if you don't do your exercises? What's going to happen if you have a new knee and you don't exercise it? It's going to lock up. It's going to just be bad. And then your muscles are going to atrophy around it, and you're going to have a big mess. I told you about my muscle atrophying when I got my cast off. My leg was shrunken and very, very hairy. It was kind of ugly. I was after six weeks in a cast. So imagine what hope looks like if it's not exercise. What does hope look like if you don't exercise it? It's a lot like despair, doesn't it? So how do you exercise hope? That's the question I'm going to ask you with, along with who do you say that Jesus Christ is? What happens? How do you exercise your hope? How do you exercise hope? Let me tell you one way you can do it. You can go back and sign up to be a Sunday school teacher. This is not just a ploy for this. Jackie's got her list right there. There's the clipboard. Because if we are not bringing the next generation into Christ, they're not going to know. They're not going to hear it in school. They're not going to hear it on the street, are they? No, they're not going to hear it at all. You are all here today. I say this all the time. You are here because somebody loved you enough to tell you about the good news of Jesus Christ, tell you you have a Savior, to tell you that there's hope for the world, there's hope for you. If Jesus can make something out of Peter, as much of a mess as he was, what can Jesus Christ do with you? That's one way to exercise your hope, is to share it with the next generation, to make sure your children and your grandchildren know that Christ loves them, that God sent his son to die for their sins, to raise them to new life, to bring them home to him, to turn their desert into a garden. 
to bring their desolate places into Eden, to break down what has been put up in between them and Christ. You are here because somebody loves you enough to bring you here or drag you here. I've told you before, I am a staunch advocate of drag your children to church. I got dragged to church. If you think I was born on the planet of pastors and I said every Sunday, oh, I can't wait to get to church. I got to college and said to my parents, if I lived at home, I said, I'm not going to church anymore. And they said, yes, you are. I said, you can't make me. I'm over 18. And they said, you live here, you're going to church. I thank them for that now. But how else do you exercise your hope in the world? Not a rhetorical question. You get to answer out loud. Be the wonder. See the wonder and share the wonder with someone else. You get it by talking about your Savior. We're so afraid to say anything that might offend someone else anymore, but if you don't exercise your hope, it's going to atrophy like a muscle. It just shrinks up and fades away. We've lost the ability to disagree with each other in this nation, haven't we, without being enemies. I watch the news every day. People call me a news nerd, but I tell you what, you've got to start speaking up about your faith in the world. If we can disagree with each other politically and still love each other in Christ, amen? Can we do that? Yes, we can do that. We can stand up against oppression for other people because I don't know if you saw the news this morning or not, but someone went into a store and shot every black person he could find because he hates black people. That is not anything that comes from Christ. And you got to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, that has to stop. Racial animus has to stop because there is nothing of Christ in that. And you have to be able to say that to folks when they say anything other than that. There is no supremacy between the races. We are all created in the image of God who loves us and died for our sins. So if you cannot see Christ in the mirror every day and see the image of God there, you got to look for it there and you got to look for it in everybody that you meet, no matter what color they are, their background, their accent, nothing matters because they are created in the image of God. They're meant to be loved and cherished because that is who Christ calls us to be. There's so much hope in the world, but we've got to see it. We've got to embrace it. We've got to share it with others. Or we're just going to be like the rest of the world, just watch the world just go the way of the gnats till everybody's buried and it's all dead. Or we could fill this church with children because we love them enough to teach them the love of God and Jesus Christ. A lot of kids going back to school who are scared to go back to school because of the dangers of being in school these days. They're scared of bullies. They're scared of being shot. They're scared of all these things that could happen to them. They're scared of failing a test. They're scared of anything and everything that might be out there in the world. We've got to pray for them every day. I want you to join me. I pray for them by name every day. I took the summer off because they weren't in school, but I'm going to start tomorrow. Every child in this church by name. Anybody who gives me their grandchildren's name, I pray for them as well. I want you to join me in doing that and work at the school if you can. Volunteer your time. Read to kids. But more than that, tell children here that they are loved by their Savior. And tell them that their Savior is the Pantocrator. He is the sovereign of all things. He is all-powerful. He is God incarnate. And he loves them. If we can do that, then hope will be reborn in us. To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Do you please stand now and join in singing number 368 in the United Methodist Hymnal. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. 